So I can give you guys a little bit of history um, on how um, I got into the business and, and then, you know, and, and just to basically a bird's eye view on, on the, the state of the business and breaking down the roles of uh, songwriters, the roles of producers um, in regards to artists and executives. Um, I started in this business professionally in like 1995 with uh, a mentor of mine who's a great, great guy, a cat named Greg Curtis. Anybody in here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Greg, uh, I met him through another friend of mine named Teron, and you know we had they, they all had the same management. And Greg, early saw something in me early that um, my mom always knew I had, but you know in Houston it's kind of it was kind of tough getting getting heard, you know, especially in, back then it, there was no voice for R and B, you know, it was either the church or you was rapping. You know, and um, Greg Curtis was a person that had seen a lot at that point. He had uh, been on tour with Blackstreet and Keith Sweat. <clears throat> he had, um, you know, been signed to Bernard Bell, who, who, you know, was Teddy Riley's partner for, for many years. He had worked with Keith Crouch. So he had seen a lot, you know, and he had made some money, you know, touring with the Tonys. So he built the studio and he uh, allowed me to have free reign. Um, if you will, in regards to developing my craft. And uh, I was very devoted to the, to the craft part of it. Um, you know, it's one thing to be talented, but it's another thing to understand what you're getting into and to understand the business and the, and the needs of the business. Um, so he kind of gave me an a, 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 a overview of how to get started. Um, and in and, and, and song structure and in how to produce. I didn't really understand anything about vocals or how to produce vocals or how the, the, the end result of a record came about. You know what I'm saying? I just knew I wrote songs. I had this little keyboard and I had a karaoke machine and I would write my little songs and, you know, playing for people. Um, Greg kind of gave me an understanding of how to stack vocals, you know, what panning meant, what EQs meant. Um, how to blend my tracks. Because, you know, at first when I was making tracks on my keyboard, I didn't really understand the, the word mix. So, you know, my piano might be hella loud and, you know, I might do this nice lead, but the lead would be tucked under and the drums were really thin and all these different things. I didn't really understand um, about producing until I got with Greg and sitting with him and hearing how bold his drum sounds were and how and how crisp his vocals were being cut. Um, I wanted to understand exactly how to make my stuff sound like that. In that period of me and Greg working together, I went to school, I, I was in high school, and I went to school with uh, two young ladies that, you know, one of the young ladies y'all know very well now, uh, by the name of Beyonce Knowles and Latoya Luckett. And, um, I was a freshman, I was a senior, they were freshmen, and um, all I knew is that, you know, these two ladies were special. They were, they were different than any other girls at the school. We went to Performing Arts High School, so everybody was special, you know. But they kind of, you know, they, they never sang. I, I never understood why they went to school. Never, they never sang a note at school, you know. And um, through a couple weeks, we became friendly. And um, then some kind of way we all kind of opened up and, and, and I found out that they were in this group and they were signed to Columbia Records and all these different things that was happening. I realized, oh, that's why you don't sing at school, you know, because <laughs> you do this for real. Um, so so um, I would always be in, my, in the practice room writing songs. Whenever I would have time in between classes, I would be in the practice room writing songs. And, um, and one day Beyonce came in and she was like, you know, play me one of those songs. So I played her a song and she was like, I really like that. Like, you need to write a song for us. I was like, I would love to, let's make it happen. She called her father. Next thing I know, we're in the studio. Me, her, Kelly Rowland, Greg Curtis, my man Scooby, and Teron. We ended up writing maybe two or three songs for them. 
and that was the day. Like I always knew I wanted to be a producer, you know, but I didn't really know what it, like I said, I didn't know what it meant. You just know that you want to do something. But that was the day I knew that that was what I was absolutely going to do, you know, because when you cut a record and he's like, when it's done, it's like, yo, this is incredible. You play it back like 30 times in the studio and you're like, loud, and you're like, man, this is hot, you know? <laughs> it, uh, it, it, uh, it, it definitely, it stamped that that's what I was gonna do. So then my journey started. I think, I think that's when the journey really started. I was having a conversation with somebody yesterday about this, like, you know, everything that leads up to your journey starting is just like the pregame, it's preseason, you know? Once you make a decision, to step out there and say, you know what, I'm going for it, you know. Um, that's when your journey starts. And I made the decision, I was like, you know, I'm moving to Atlanta and I'm gonna figure it out. I felt like Atlanta was the, was the best of both worlds. It was a place where it was a lot of stuff, that, a lot of things that were going on musically, but it still wasn't a far stretch from me being from Houston. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm Southern by nature. I was born in Miami, I was raised in Houston. I'm, I'm a Southern boy to my heart. So, um, so, you know, L.A. was kind of like, me moving to L.A. was kind of like, that's too far. New York was kind of scary for me, <laughs> you know? Um, so I made a decision, I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm moving to Atlanta. And um, it was the best decision I could, I could probably have made for my life, you know? Because um, when I went out there, I went, the, the main thing I learned the very first lesson I learned in Atlanta was that time, your time is everything. Time is extremely valuable, so use your time wisely. Every writer, songwriter, producer, composer, the best advice, I mean, I'm gonna give you a bunch of things, but the overall best advice I could give you is to use your time wisely. Utilize your time wisely. Be efficient, follow up. Um, you know, follow through. Uh, just because they say no, don't mean that the next person won't say yeah. You might get to 20 no's before you get to that first yeah. You know what I'm saying? But if you believe in yourself and you believe in, in your ability to grow as a creative person, it's, it's going to be so many times before somebody says yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I'm going to give y'all my, my, one, of, one of my no stories, one of my no stories. In Atlanta, 1997, LaFace Records is huge, you know. Um, so So Deaf is huge. Um, I'm in college trying to figure it out, right? At this point, you know, this is two, maybe a year, two years after I did that work with Destiny's Child, they have a record out on the radio now popping. I'm depressed. You know? I'm just depressed. I'm like, man, you know, I was a part of that movement and for whatever reason it didn't happen. I, I couldn't be a part of that album. I really wanted to be a part of that album. You know? And it didn't happen. Um, and it wasn't my fault that it didn't happen. It just didn't happen. So um, I'm in Atlanta and I'm depressed and I'm trying to figure this whole thing out. I went to Clark and I, I went on a scholarship so I was in the, in the music department and I was, I played piano for the chorale, I was in chorale, I was in jazz band, I, the marching band, Jesus. I did everything that I could do to get some money on my, on my scholarship. So chorale takes a trip to Washington, D.C. In the midst of us, well actually no, we, we, the trip ultimately was going to New York, but it was two stops. It was a Washington, D.C. stop, then it was a New York stop for a performance. So of course I reach out to Trevor Gale, let him know, hey, I'm coming to you know, I'm coming to New York. I'll be there in like seven days. You know, okay, cool. Call me when you get here. So I get to finally get to New York and hook up with Trevor. And he, you know, I sit down. And he gives me, you know, just an incredible pep talk, and you know, and gives me some direction. And he says, you know, I want you to call this guy. His name is Jaha Johnson. He just got hired over at this new company that L.A. Reid is starting called. Uh, no, I'm sorry. He He's hired at a company that started L.A. Reid's publishing company. This company's called Windswept, okay? Windswept funded L.A. Reid's publishing company, HITCO, that was founded in 1997, okay? He says, I want you to meet this guy, Jaha. He's young, he's 
you know, got his, got his self together. He got everything going for himself. You need to sit with him. He could probably point you in the right direction. So he connects me and Jaha. I talk to Jaha on the phone. And I'm like, yo, look, man, I'll be back in Atlanta. Let's, you know, let, let's meet. He's like, okay, bet. I'm going to give you the address to LaFace, because that's where Hitco is right now. I was like, bet. So the address is like, you know, 3715 Peachtree or something like that. Okay. Who all has been, have been to Atlanta? Okay. So you guys are aware how long of a street Peachtree is, right? Okay. So I'm just excited to get a meeting any, with anybody. You know, I have all my music ready, you know, the whole nine. So he gives me the address. I'm like, all right, I'm going to figure this out. Now, where Clark Atlanta University is, it's downtown or near downtown, okay? I hadn't really ventured outside of that area too much. And in in, I knew where Peachtree was near that area. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, well, you know, Peachtree's right up the street. I just, I walk, you know, I'll take Mitchell, I'll walk up to Mitchell, I'll make a, <laughs> see the left on Peachtree, and this, you know, Peachtree can't be that long, you know? Yeah. So I'm just walking and walking and walking. And uh, because I, you know, I, 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 I had no money, you know, I, you know, I either was going to either use the $10 I had in my pocket to ride the martyr, or I was going to use the $10 to get some water, and eat some food. So I chose the food. I'm like, you know, oh, what am I gonna do? You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna eat, you know? So I'm walking. So I don't know if anybody understands how, how, how long this walk is, how far this is. I walked from Peachtree and Mitchell Street, right? Cause I, I'm, I'm, I'm not even talking about walking from the school to Mitchell Street. We're not even gonna, that's water under the bridge. <laughs> I walked from Peachtree and Mitchell Street all the way past the Fox Theater, all the way past, um, um, you know, all the way down. It's like past Piedmont. It's like 10 miles, like nine miles. It's, you know, but I didn't know. You know what I'm saying? I'm looking at the numbers like, okay, well, okay, the numbers are going up. Boom, then the numbers started going down again. You know? So I'm like, well, I'm already half, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking in my mind, I gotta be almost there. That's why I kept walking. I mean, I, I, gotta, I gotta almost be there. And you know, I'm walking, walking. I finally find a building. And so LaFace was at this Blue, Blue Shield building, the Blue Shield building across the street from Lenox Mall. The Lenox Station is like, maybe Lenox Mall is like maybe a block up, you know? So yeah, I walked a long way. Finally got to the office, went up there to talk to Jaha and Shakir, Shakir Stewart, God, God bless his dead. Um, and I play my songs. And Shakir looks at me and he says, you have potential, but I can't do nothing with these songs. He's like, you need some work, you need development. Um, of, of, you're being signed to a publishing company, I have to acquire copyrights that are gonna make some money. Right now, I can't really do nothing with this, but I could point you in the right direction. And he basically said, are you aware of this company called Noontime? I was like, yeah, I'm already kind of trying to intern for them. He was like, well, you need to probably really, really connect with them, get your craft together, you know, get it up to par. I knew that I was at a certain level, but when you, got, when you get to Atlanta, you have all these incredible producers and songwriters out there. Like, you know, for lack of a better word, excuse my French, my shit wasn't adding up. You know what I mean? It just wasn't, they was all the way up here and I still was at the starting block. You know what I mean? And I had to be real with myself and look in the mirror and say, you know what? Yeah, maybe I should take his advice and go, go to noon time and just kind of build a little more. You know what I'm saying? So I was committed to building. Went back to noontime and started really like getting into everything everybody was doing. Understanding what Jazzy Faye was doing, understanding what Teddy Bishop was doing, understanding what J Dub was do doing, understanding what K Fan was doing. This, these are all the people who were signed to noontime at the time. 
during this period of enlightenment, I met John Tay Austin. And um, I met Brian and Brandon Casey from Jagged Edge. So um, Jazzy was always, was always a fun, he's like my big brother, always fun loving, you know, fun loving guy, Jazzy, just always laughing and smiling, you know, but he's an incredible talent. He would come in there and watch me work, like, yo, like this dude, he's learning fast. He's learning fast. So he went and had a conversation with Teddy Bishop, and then they went and had a conversation with Nooney, and was like, yo, you might need to sign this kid. Like, this dude is learning quick. He's, he's, he's going, he got something. So then Nooney calls me, he's like, yo, I want to sign you. I said, cool. So, of course, I wasn't going to say no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you want to sign me? Absolutely. So um, I signed, I signed a noon time, and then with me signing noon time simultaneously, I started working with Brian and Brandon Casey, and we ended up making songs that turned into being Je Heartbreak. Anybody know aware of that album, Jagged Edges, Je Heartbreak? So we ended up doing that process of us making songs that ended up being like J.E. Heartbreak. Now me and Jonte were closer in age, so we always, or we always hung out, but we hadn't written any songs together yet. So we did a song called, me and, Jack, me and Brian and Brandon did a song called uh, What You Trying to Do For It. It ended up being on J.E. Heartbreak album. And Jonte heard it and was like, yo, I want you to make me a track like that. And I'm gonna, I, I want to write to a track like that. I was like, okay, cool, I'll, you know, I'll get around to it. So a few days later, I got around to it. Gave him the track, I gave him a skeleton of a track. And then he wrote this song called Get Gone. And in the midst of that, I got a call from Donnie Scans, who y'all, anybody here know who D Scans is? Okay, Donnie Scans is, the, he's one of the greatest producers in the business that you guys don't really know, but he's, he's like a vet in the game. You know what I'm saying? Um, uh, I got a call from D Scans and he says, yo, I'm bringing the guys out there, Ideal. And mind you, backstory, me, Donnie Scantz, Ideal, we all are from Houston. We all grew up together. So he said, I'm bringing the guys out. I know you got some songs for us. I was like, absolutely, bring them out, let's do it. So, and, and, and we did Get Gone, we did Creep In, we did all these records, and then Get Gone comes out. In the midst of doing Get Gone, we have a meeting, me and Jagged Edge have a meeting with Jermaine about their album. So all these, all these things started, now, now, now pace is the story, it's kind of starting to stack up now. Everything's starting to stack up. Ideal comes out, and me and Jack still have an argument about what came out first, but I'm almost positive Ideal came out first. Ideal comes out, and the song goes up the charts. In the midst of that, me and Jermaine start working, we finish up Jagged's album, and then He Can't Love You comes out, which is a record that I produced, and it goes to the top of the charts. So now, it becomes a, a whirlwind, you know what I'm saying? Everything starts becoming a blur. And now this is where the real lessons start coming in, okay? Um, as a producer, your duty is to see a project all the way through from the top to the finish, okay? So from the creation, you know, it, let me backtrack, let me backtrack. There are two definite, I, I got on Ustream the other day and I said there were three definitions. There's really two definitions of producing, okay? So you have the producer that's like the Quincy Jones, right? Who was a talented composer, one of the most incredible arrangers. I mean, he's incredible all the way around. But Quincy Jones is the orchestrator of the whole everything that's going on, which is the real definition of a producer, okay? I got my rhythm section, I got my string section, I got my background vocalist, I'm going to listen to the songs that the songwriters bring in, I'm going to pick which songs work for this particular artist, blah, blah. Basically, the producer, Quincy Jones, is an A&R, okay? I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about a and in the new millennium, too, because a and now is not what it used to be. That's a whole other conversation. The new definition of producing is really composing, or what people call beat making, but I don't want to I don't want to um, make it sound less than what it is. Composing is very important. You know what I'm saying? Um, and I think that people get the two misconstrued. Okay, you have a lot of producers that basically will hand their compositions 
off to lyric melody people, and the lyric melody people end up producing it for real. Do you understand what I mean by that? Okay, there is, you have a producer who composes a beat, right? He'll hand it off to a Sean Gary, or he'll hand it off to a Adana Shropshire, right? But y'all, y'all are aware who Adonis is, right? And then Adonis would take, or Sean would take the beat and write a melody, create all these harmonies, do all this stuff to this eight bar loop. Okay, because that's what, essentially that's what you're writing to, you know what I mean? And then, in most cases, okay, at that point, right, the songwriter's supposed to hand it back off to the producer, and the producer's supposed to get it placed, right? That doesn't happen like that anymore too, too, too often, because now songwriters get things placed, right? So you have a Sean, Sean Garrett who, he gets his own records placed. So now, that's taking the producer, the, the leverage away from the composer even more. So now Sean Garrett is, he made the record, because he basically, you gave him an eight-bar loop, he made the record. Now he's going to play the record for Beyonce or, you know, whoever. They like the record, they're going to cut it. But Beyonce don't know the composer or the producer, so who's she going to want to cut her vocals? Sean Garrett, right? So now you're getting into territory where a composer is making a producer fee, like a $40,000, $50,000 producer fee, and... The songwriter's looking at him like, well, I did all the work. So then now there's been, there's been a rift, a, com a complete split in that, that, that community. Now songwriters are like, yo, I'm a producer. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, I'm producing this. So if you want me to write to the joint, it's going to cost 15000 <laughs> You know what I mean? And, and you know, at first you're like, oh, well, you know, that, that's retarded. But you... But when you break down the work, it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. If, if they're going to finish it, and then, Lord forbid, you know, producers just, a lot of times you don't even, a lot of time now producers don't even hear the songs until it's on the radio. Well, that's my beat right there. Woo! <laughs> but... It's, it, it, we, we have to, we, as, as creative people, if you, are, if you want to be a producer, if you want to be a producer, your primary objective is to see it all the way through. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's your primary objective. That is your job. Your job is to see it all the way through. So when I give a record to Sean Garrett to write, he got to give it back to me. Yeah. Because I don't like having to split my $40,000, $50,000 fee. You know what I'm saying? If you're going to charge them for writing it, you charge them for writing it. But, I'm, but give the song back to me so I can say I like it, change this, change that, or, or, or whatever. Then I can say, let me, let me do my job. You know what I mean? Let me go and get it to Monica, get it to whoever, and let me cut the vocal, and let me do my job. You know what I'm saying? Or we may agree, like on the Monica record, me and Sean Gary did a record for Monica called um, Hell No on one of her records. And we agreed. I was like, you know what? You should do the vocal. He did the vocal, we split the production credit. It's fair. Fair is fair. You know what I'm saying? And if you see any, anybody who I've ever worked with, if you see any credits, it always, it's always fair. You know what I mean? I'm a fair person. And I feel like I've been blessed because of that. Because a lot of people aren't fair. You know what I'm saying? So let's get down to the business of songwriting. Okay. Y'all all aware that songwriting is a business, right? Y'all aware that this is not just, you know, you're not just writing your, writing your thoughts and they just go in the air. It is a business. How many of y'all do a lot of collaborations? Y'all people in, okay, I, I, I definitely encourage it um, because two heads are always better than one and you never know what, what, how your energy, especially when it's good energy, you never know what comes out of that. But when you are collaborating, don't get caught up in how good the energy is and miss out on the business. Yeah, gotta clap for that. 
Tough it out. Because people get amnesia. Figure out, always, when you're in a session, songwriters, in a session, songwriters, when you're in a session, have the split sheet ready. Have it ready. Have it ready. Keeps everybody honest. You know what I'm saying? Because after the song is written, oh yeah, this is great. I played back 10 times, the song is incredible. Okay, so, you wrote what? Okay, I wrote this, then the third, boom, 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 this, then the third, let's figure it out. Now, I came up with a, with a, with a, with a foolproof mathematical, like a math solution on how to break down songs when you're doing splits. I wanna hear it? Yes. Okay. We know that songwriting songs are 50% music, 50% lyrics, okay? So I broke it down where, on the lyric side, 50%. The hook, because the chorus and the hook comes, it's the bulk of it, it's the, it's the actual foundation of the song, is 25%. On top of the 50? No, no, this is, this is in the 50. We, 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 we're splitting the 50. 50 music, 50 lyric. I'm breaking the lyric 50 down, okay? So, 25% is the hook. If somebody comes and they write the whole hook, that's coming three, four times in the song, that's 25%. Okay, not, now mind you, this is just my math, this is the way I do my math. I don't know if everybody do, you know, <laughs> the way I do my math. 25% is the hook. Most likely there's gonna be two verses, right? So the verse is 10% a piece. Okay? Bridges are 5%. Now the music side can get a little tricky from a mathematical perspective because I could go into the studio and create an entire musical composition and I may add a few elements. And you don't know if, am I producing or am I writing? You know what I'm saying? The lines kind of get blurred at that point. If I, if I create something and I call in a certain guitar player and he, I'm like, yo, play something and he plays something, he's creating something on, some, on top of something that I created, but it's clearly him creating on top of it, right? And it feels good. He probably is gonna feel like, well, I wrote that line. You know what I'm saying? Or oh, I wrote that guitar motif, because I didn't tell him, hey, play this, that, boom, 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 boom. He just went in there and kind of vibed it out, and I kept it. Now that's producing too, but it's also, it blurs into writing. So. Like for instance, I, I have a frequent collaborator, this cat named Craig Love, that that's how we kind of roll. Like he'll, I'll do something and it may be completely finished. And he'll come in and he'll do Craig Love on top of it, was and lines and this, that, and the third, and he's creating. And I'll say, okay, you know what, I'm gonna keep that line, I'm gonna take that while, I'm gonna do this, that, boom, boom, boom. I'll still give him publishing because it's like, you know, you wrote that even though I fixed it. But I'm, but I'm also, person, I'm just, a, I'm just a different type of person, you know what I'm saying? Um, um, so music could get a little weird, you know what I mean, the music part of it. Or like, I don't know if you guys uh, uh, know my cousin Kendrick Dean, Wildcard. He's a composer, we've, we've, we've composed a lot of things together. It's so like for instance, Say Goodbye, right? The piano motif in Say Goodbye was composed by Kendrick. He created the whole piano thing, you know. Um, I came in and basically did everything around it all the strings, all the, the drums, all the extra extras. I did all of that. So we split the composition part of it evenly. So he got 25%, I got 25%. You know what I'm saying? Um, sometimes I'll do the, like the majority of it. And he'll come in and do strings or do something. You know, then I'll say, okay, yo, we'll figure out a percentage. But we talk about it. The main thing, the main thing I want to let y'all know is y'all have to talk about these things. When y'all in, in that room. Because then when y'all walk out of that room and nobody signed off on nothing, look out. Especially if it's people that you don't normally work with on a regular basis. I'm gonna give you guys a story about that. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put this person's business out there, but 
she's gonna know who I'm talking about when I'm when I'm about to tell the story. Marcus Houston. I did a song called Circle. And we uh, allowed a friend of ours to come in and write with us for the Marcus Houston sessions. Um, well, an associate of mine. She was signed to a friend of mine. She's a talented songwriter. Come in, we wrote one song. Fair, square, split, split it down, the, we'll split it down the middle because she was throwing ideas in there the whole night, right? Get to circle, right? Circle um, is an idea. Me and Adonis talked about it for about an hour before she came to the studio. She got to the studio. We were already halfway, you know, halfway done with the song, damn it. But she's throwing ideas in, and they weren't really sticking. You know, I'm like, I don't like that. And you know, the, the ideas were, you know, the, the vibe was kind of off. But because she was in the room throwing around ideas, I was like, you know, we're still gonna, we're gonna look her out. We're gonna still give her some publishing. We're just gonna look it out. So I think that we talked about. 12.5% publishing, but we never signed off on no paperwork, right? Song comes out, becomes a hit. My publisher calls me, like, oh, you, you co-wrote this song with this person? I was like, yeah. You know, I gave her props, oh yeah. It's like, you know she's claiming like 40% of this record. I'm like, huh? Of the, this record or the other record? No, no, no. She's coming 40% of the record that's on the radio, that's at that's the top five on, you know what I'm saying, there's, there's a hit. She's claiming 40% of the hit. So and this is another lesson I learned. Don't never take anything personal. Write that down. Because I took this very personal. And I called her, and I went crazy on her. I never in my life, like I'm, I'm pretty much a laid back, calm, you know. I, I rarely get angry, I rarely, you know what I'm saying? But I just kind of felt like, you are, like come on, like you, none of your word, not one word stuck that you threw out there. <laughs> and I was still kind enough because you were in the room throwing out ideas to give you 12.5% of the record, or 10% of the record, something like that. It was like, it was a, it was a large, show. it was more than 5% which was she shouldn't have got nothing. Yeah. I'm getting upset thinking about it right now. Yeah. But no, but just, in no disrespect, like, you know, since then we're, we've, we've patched it up and we're cool. Me and that particular song right now, cool. I won't work with her ever again, but we're cool. Um, but, but it just, I learned two valuable lessons. Paperwork. Don't take anything personal. Okay. People are gonna tell you no a bunch of times. You can't take it personal. Because once, once you get a hit record, let me tell you something. Uh, a hit record changes all bets are off. Changes everything. They look you in your eye, you come in there, you playing your songs like, oh, you're whack, you're whack. This is whack, this is terrible. Let you get a hit record, that same a and <laughs> That same executive, that same producer, that same person. Oh, that, pff, we, we need to be cocks over here. But you just said I was terrible a month ago. You know what I'm saying? Just a month ago. Now I got a record at the top of the charts, and so you just you can't you can't take it personal. You just have to ride the you gotta ride the wave, man. Ride the wave. While you're riding the wave, take care of your money. People, dry spells come. They come. Writer's block comes. Comes. So just imagine how you feel right now at your entry level or at the level you are coming up in the business and you get writer's block. Imagine, how does that make you feel? It makes you feel like, damn, I need, to, I need to get on the ball. Just imagine once you start living a certain lifestyle, and you catch writer's block. And you ain't take care of your money. Dry spells come, man. It's how you handle yourselves in those dry spells that makes you, that, that you know, shows how you come back. You know what I'm saying? 
And even in your hot spells, right, your, how you handle your relationships in your hot spells determine how you survive in your dry spells. You know what I'm saying? So, if you're the hot songwriter or the hot producer, and you walking around, you know, jeweled up and shades, and bent lead up, and every, you know, and, and, and your attitude uh, uh, um, kind of just gives that off. If you're like a cocky, arrogant, you know, SOB, right? People remember that. So you better stay hot. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like people remember that. Because once you are not hot, if you, was a, if you was a prick and you're not hot no more, people are praying to see you fall off. People are praying to see you fall off even when you're just a good person with a hit record. If you are a prick, they're like, man, I hope this dude, I hope he get hit by a bus. <laughs> so how you handle your relationships in your hot spell is how it determines how you survived in your dry spell. I've seen people get 20, 30, 40 million dollar deals and be hot as fish grease and can't pay you to listen to their stuff. They can't say, yo, here's 100,000 and listen to my record. You're like, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want the money. Because you was a prick. You know what I'm saying? So you, how you handle your relationship, and it's just life, man. Like, that's what this whole thing is about. How you handle yourself in life is how you handle yourself in the business. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Every deal that you do, do whatever deal you got, whatever, you, whatever deal you can do to, to not be in debt. Because once you go in debt, man, phew. it's like working your way out of a 10-foot hole. You know what I'm saying? Don't nobody ever want to work with that kind of pressure. Because creative people, we don't want to, we don't work, we don't have normal minds. You know what I'm saying? So when you're pressurized, it totally affects everything that you do. What happened over the past 10 to 12 years in the music business where you know, people started really, really just opening up the billboard and saying, okay, who's the top 10 producers or top 10 songwriters? Okay, we're gonna get these people to, to, to write. We're gonna hire all these people. Instead of saying, back in the day, you had to go find, you know, you know Puffy had to go find Chucky Thompson. You know what I'm saying? You go find him. You know what I mean? It wasn't like Chucky was, you know, when like somebody opened the book and was like, oh yeah, well, I want Chucky Thompson to do Mary J. Blige's new record. Puff went to go find him, was like, yo, this dude hot. Have him do it. You know what I'm saying? ARs don't do that no more. ARs. Well, it, it, it might be getting back to that. I'm 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 hopeful, because there's some things happening, some transitions happening in the business. And I'm hopeful. Some of the people that I know are 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 getting back to the basics. And we all kind of lost sight at some point. I think a lot of the people who are getting, are getting back to basics, getting back to the, the raw talent, because it's been, it's, been, it's been hurtful these past couple years, man. Hurt to listen to the radio. <laughs> Hurt, you know what I mean? <laughs> okay, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm a rap, I've been talking, talking, talking. I gotta wrap this up. Um, should we? Should we do, anybody want just questions? Or are we good? Okay. All right. Well, I'm. I'm sorry. Can't do questions. I'm. In, I'm gonna talk into y'all question time. We, we do two. Do, do we do two questions? Are you staying, Brent? Um, so as far as yes, I'm staying. Okay, if you have ownership, you know what I'm saying? Okay, like for instance, if you are, from a songwriting perspective, you, you don't take an advance if 
they're only administering your publishing. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Right. And, and administering your publishing means they, they don't own it. Right. They basically, you pay them a percentage to administer your publishing. Okay. Go get the money, you know, if there's stuff out there. But as a new artist, or as a new songwriter, well, what, do you, songwriter. Yeah, what are we administering if you're new? Right. You see what I'm saying? That's the problem. As an artist, if you don't want to take an advance, say, okay, yo, I don't want an advance, but I want. Now, mind you, I was only saying that from perspective of, at the time I was offered a million dollars, I had 10 hit records out. You know what I'm saying? So the perspective that I was talking from was being already having money in the pipeline and saying that, you know what? I got about half a million in the pipeline. Let me not take the million dollars. Let me look good on my, on my end year, you know, the, the end year report and let everybody at the company get bonuses, so when it comes back around, then they'll just want to give it to me. It won't even be like a, it won't be a question, they'll be like, oh, this dude is smart. Right. You know what I'm saying? As a new artist, I just. Not knowing who to trust, obviously, it's like these yeah. labels are coming to you, but obviously it's scary when you're first like. If labels are coming at you, they need to have some money. If, you're talking like a producer, if you're like you're being signed to a producer, a label, or if labels come out, you gotta figure, I mean, something, you need to live. They're a label, and they're trying to get 50% of your publishing and 360 and no money, that ain't, that ain't the business. You, I wouldn't do that. That's just my personal opinion. Thank you. My man. How do you deal with the uh, publishing rights on your split sheet when you I'm sorry, what's the question again? Oh, okay. What happens is on, on split sheets, they they they'll break it down, and they'll say, okay, um, they'll say writers, and then you'll put your writing name, then you'll put your percentage, and then they'll say publisher, and then you put, and then they'll say PRO, whether it be ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, and you'll check each one. So, but that paperwork, you know, and I, and, I, and people still, it's amazing how people still don't do it. You know what I'm saying? You are your publisher. At that point, you are your publisher. You know what I'm saying? So whenever you set up, you're a CSEC writer, right? So you set up a publishing company here, too. So when you, if you don't have a publishing deal, you're your publisher. You publish, you self-publish. So, uh, one, one more up there. It all depends, you know what I'm saying? It all depends. I mean, for me, when I did, when I did my first publisher, I did my first publisher deal for thirty thousand dollars. You know, that number sounds low, but at the time I didn't have no records. You know what I'm saying? You know, and I was signed to a company that had records. That was these guys were moving. So in that case, it, it worked out for me. And that thirty thousand dollars turned into, you know, years of me making millions of dollars. So. But did you have an agreement then that you could get out of it? Only did my did. Luckily, I had favor on my life. Yeah. The agreement that I was in. Um, <laughs> the agreement I was in. Every time a change happened, every time I hit, had a hit record, I was able to go back and say, "Hey, can we change this?" And they're like, oh yeah, right, of course we can change it. So luckily for me, I was in a place where, and also, they weren't really as organized as they needed to be neither. So when it came time for them to do a new joint venture, Warner Chapel, right, they didn't have all of their ducks in order. So we had to scrap all our old deals anyway and do new deals. So, so in, to organize, big streamline their company, the streamline we were doing, and it turned, it turned out for our benefit. I gotta get out of here. They go. I, I, <laughs> Brian Michael Cox, everybody.